I love this thing more than I was expecting to. When I was first offered this, I thought, yeah, sure, whatever. At least it'll look cool in a video. But when I first got my hands on it, I was, first of all, surprised at how big it was and how good it felt. I was surprised by how good the screen looked and what it was capable of. This is the RG351V by Anbernick. And not only is it a good looking console, but it is a powerhouse capable of a lot of portable emulation. It fixes a lot of what I don't like about other portable emulators, even if the emulation it provides isn't perfect all of the time. This video is sponsored by ExpressVPN. Hey, Cyber Bob Wolf coming at you from cyberspace. cyberspace. What are you doing over there? Just kidding, I know exactly what you're doing. You're doing sensitive work without an encryption. Turn that VPN on, that one. Turn it on, do it right now. Do it now, do it now. Do it now, oh, yeah, baby. That's what I'm talking about. Stop that. Shut up. See, now I can't even tell what you're doing. Real talk though, I've been having a lot of success with VPNs lately. No cap. I'm Cyber Bob Wolf, I get, I get all the lingo. I'm ending the bit. For real, just last night, I was trying to watch a YouTube trailer from a J-pop band, and the video wasn't available in my country. Not even a problem, bam! Express VPN to the rescue. Here's a weird one, for months, my Twitch streams would randomly drop connection every few minutes for around one minute and then automatically reconnect. It was so annoying. I tried everything. I even tried reaching out on Twitter and doing all these things that everybody else said and nothing worked. The only thing that worked was using a VPN. Now my Twitch streams are significantly more stable. I haven't had a dropped connection since. I legitimately have to use ExpressVPN every single time I Twitch stream, probably because my ISP sucks. But whatever, as long as it works. A VPN's best use cases are encrypting your data so not even your ISP can see what you're doing and changing your location to access blocked content. ExpressVPN was rated the number one VPN provider by CNET, Wired, Tech Radar, The Verge, and me. But don't take our word for it. Try it for yourself and see how you like it. Find out how you can get three months free so that you can try it for yourself by either clicking the link in the description below or going to expressvpn.com slash wolfden. And maybe you'll find out that it solves some problems for you, or at the very least, you can listen to some sick J-pop. Let's get one thing out of the way. That wood finish is fake. It doesn't really say anywhere online, but it's just a wrap on the plastic. But it does feel really good. It kind of feels like one of those vinyl wood finishes that you can get on like flooring or something. So it actually feels kind of nice. And it looks real, even up close. It kind of has a slight grain feel to it, even though it's clearly fake. It's still better than the other boring gray and smoky transparent colors that this thing can come in. Emulator consoles have all been relatively the same recently, so it's hard to keep track. My previous favorite portable emulator was kind of a toss up between the Anbernic RG350M and the Retroid Pocket 2. And I think I just broke the screen on here. No, it looks fine, it looks fine. No wonder these things come with uh, screen protectors that I never use. This is the RG351V. So part of the same family of consoles as one of my previous favorites. It adopts a lot of the build quality that I liked, a lot of the same buttons that I liked a lot, but almost nothing else under the hood. This guy sports a 3.5 inch IPS screen that looks huge in this form factor because my brain is comparing it to a Game Boy, but it's actually pretty standard on these devices. So is the 640 by 480 resolution. It might sound low res, but at 3.5 inches, it's actually insanely crisp. 
It has a 1.5 gigahertz quad core processor, a Mali G31 MP2 GPU, which means nothing to me, and one gigabyte of DDR3L RAM. Technically, it is around twice as powerful as the RG350M and more powerful than a lot of the consoles I've tried previously. And because of this, it could play a lot. I can't find a full list online, but it can basically play anything you can throw at it all the way up to Nintendo DS. I was able to play basically everything in my ROM library. On here, I've got NES, Game Boy, SNES, N64, Game Boy Color, Game Boy Advance, Sega Master System, Sega Genesis, Sega Game Gear, Sega Dreamcast, PlayStation 1, and Nintendo DS. There's more that you could put on here. I'm sure you can get very obscure with it. This is what the micro SD card file system looked like on mine. So I'm sure that all of these folders correspond to a system that can be played on here, I would guess. So if you're one of those guys who are really looking for Wonder Swan or Turbo Graphics, if you see it here, you could probably get it to run on the RG351V. All of this functionality is all well and good, but it doesn't mean much if the controls aren't set up for these certain systems. This guy has the same D-pad as the RG350M, which I think is the best D-pad these devices can have. It has the same kind of Joy-Con style thumbstick. Insert joke about Joy-Con drift here. Ha 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 ha. It's kind of in an awkward spot, but that's okay. I don't expect to be playing much games that require the use of a thumbstick on this thing anyway. It has the required A, B, X, Y buttons, start, select, a function button. On the back, there's four shoulder buttons set up horizontally. Usually I don't like this, but the fact that they're different heights makes up for it. It feels kind of like how you would hold a DualSense or Xbox controller with the meat of your fingers pressing the bumpers and the tip pressing the triggers. Of course, you have volume up and down on one side and power and reset on the other. There's dual micro SD card slots and dual USB-C ports, none of which are labeled. Only the left USB-C port is for charging. The right one is for interfacing or uploading ROMs if you want to do it that way. Which brings me to my favorite part about this console. Putting ROMs on here is a breeze. Thank God. It's previously been such a pain in the ass on these other consoles. Sometimes you gotta stick a USB thumb drive in there and run a script on it to copy them. Sometimes you gotta use a Linux file system reader to even open the micro SD card on a computer. Not this one. The first micro SD card slot already has a micro SD card on there containing the OS. If you wanted to, you could simply plop in an additional micro SD card into the second slot that already has all your games on there. So it's easily expandable, but it's even easier than that. You don't even need another micro SD card. All you need to do is take out the existing micro SD card and plop it into the computer. That's it. It has three partitions on it already. The main OS is on a Linux formatted partition, but the games partition is fat formatted. So you can just plop your games on there no problem. Why the f aren't all the other emulators set up this way? It makes my life so much easier. My other major problem with most of these portable emulators is the clunky UI that they come pre-packaged with. This one comes with a Linux-based OS called Emulec, but it has the Emulation Station UI already pre-installed, and I quite like that a lot. It's very simple and straightforward. It only shows the consoles you have games for, and you just press left or right to navigate through them. That's it. The cover images for each is a bit weird and sometimes doesn't make much sense, but I'm happy with it. I'm sure there's ways to change this. Maybe I can even use that scraper app that I used in the Pocket Go S30 video to upload my own box art for each ROM, but I can't be bothered. I'm just thrilled it's this easy to navigate right out of the box. Performance is both surprising and disappointing. DS games run okay, which is more than I can say for any of these other portable emulators that I have. If you're here because you wanna play some DS Pokemon games, you'll probably have a fine time. You might be wondering how that's possible with just one screen. Well, you can change which screen you're looking at on the fly by pressing L2 or R2.
There we go. Unfortunately, movement is done with the control stick for some reason. The D-pad controls the touchscreen cursor. There are options for this system, but I could not for the life of me get to the controller options. The menu was just too glitchy. DS is the only console on here that does not run on RetroArch. It runs on its own emulator. I've had problems with RetroArch in the past. It's kind of a pain to navigate and it's hard to tweak for each console that you wanna play. Each console runs games differently and should have its own set of controls and settings to compensate. Each emulator should be catered to each system, right? But I guess having a unified system across all devices does have its perks. RetroArch has started to grow on me a little bit. Plus it has different emulator cores that you can try out, but that doesn't usually help much. That being said, I was very disappointed by the SNES emulation on this thing. That's something that shouldn't be a problem at all for this powerhouse of a console. Yoshi's Island is a game that could break some emulators because of its use of the SuperFX2 chip, and it has a ton of slowdown on here. I couldn't figure out how to tweak RetroArch to fix that. Right after that, I loaded up Super Mario World, which also had a bunch of slowdown. Ooh. Why? But after changing a bunch of settings and playing for a few minutes, it started to run just fine. I don't think I actually changed any settings in the end. I think the system just needed to like settle. I don't know. Mega Man X ran fine right out of the gate. It'll probably run whatever SNES game you wanna play just fine. Unless that game happens to be Yoshi's Island and you just can't stand slow down, then uh, I mean, you're, you're out of luck. Every other console ran just fine. Genesis games were smooth as butter. Game Boy, Game Boy Advance, even PlayStation runs just fine. Nintendo 64 is notoriously hard to emulate. It runs pretty good on here. Some dropped frames in a power intensive game like Perfect Dark, but nothing too game breaking. Oh. Oh. Oh no. <laughs> Mario 64 had some weird textures and minor frame drops, but handled just fine by me. The biggest issue I had was the thumbstick being registered as both a D-pad and a thumbstick at the same time. So if you want to play Perfect Dark, you have to disable the D-pad buttons in RetroArch for some reason. It was a very strange bug. There is a neat setting that allows you to hold R2 to toggle the face buttons to work like C buttons. That way you can play GoldenEye or Perfect Dark like a twin stick shooter. This device also supports Dreamcast games, but much like other emulators I've tried, games that push the limits of the console like Sonic Adventure 2 are rough, and games like Power Stone 2 run just fine. It's not a perfect console, and I definitely didn't expect it to be. It only has one speaker, but the speaker is pretty good. And it does not have an HDMI out, which could be a problem for some of you. Both the RG350M and the Retroid Pocket 2 have HDMI outs, but I'm not getting these things to plug into my monitor. That's what I have my computer for, and I can emulate pretty much anything I want on my computer. I'm a little disappointed in some of the technical hiccups in some emulators. I'm sure that there's ways to tweak RetroArch to run certain emulators a little bit better. That's not what I'm here for. You can go look at ETA Prime or Retro Game Core for that, I'm sure. I think it's absolutely ridiculous that they don't optimize these things right out of the box. That should be a given. But in comparison to a lot of the other retro emulators that I've used, even with its janky emulation here or there, I think I like this one the most. None of these emulate games perfectly. The amount of consoles you can play on this thing is huge. The fact that you can just plop games on here without running a script or a third-party software is also huge. The form factor is awesome. It's like a big, powerful Game Boy, but more streamlined. It has the perfect amount of buttons, but they're laid out in a great configuration. I don't even think it's a problem that it doesn't have a right analog stick. 
barely any PS1 games would utilize that right analog stick anyway, and I barely even play PS1 games on these things anyway. I know you're sick of me saying this already, but at $109, this thing might be the best emulation console you can buy right now. Keep in mind that these companies keep topping themselves every other month and release a new console that is like ever so slightly better than the previous one that they just made. It's like buying a computer. The best time to buy one is whenever you're ready because once you buy it, technology is just gonna keep going without you anyway. If you already have a Retroid Pocket 2 or an RG350M, this doesn't automatically invalidate that purchase or render it obsolete. I like this one like a hair more. They all run games very similarly. They're all just fine. I'm not even sure I would call this an upgrade. Like, yeah, it feels nice. And I guess janky DS games are cool too. So what do you guys think about the RG351V? Is this something that will finally get you into these portable emulation consoles? Or is this something that you think is worth upgrading to for some reason? Does it do something that one of your portable emulation devices can't do? What is it that makes you want it or not want it at all? Leave it in the comments below, at me on Twitter, and any and all of this other social media garbage. Listen, they're all great and you could do a lot of tweaking to them and make them all probably run great and do everything that you want. I cannot be bothered to do that. I want them to run great right out of the box and I'm sure most of you are the same way. You like my 35 Mario mug? Anyway, we got new videos here all the time, at least once a week. Make sure you're subscribed and turn on those notifications so you know when these videos are here because you can't rely on YouTube to show you the videos on your homepage. It's much easier to get a notification than you click on that notification, it helps us out. We also got streams on twitch.tv slash wolfden because again, I don't trust this platform. You can turn on notifications there so you know when I'm live and we can talk more live person to person about stuff like this. And of course, the most important thing that you can do to help support this channel is a subscribe again and share this video with a friend, a friend who maybe is looking to get into these portable emulation devices or has one and might need a slight upgrade. Thank you very much. You have yourself a very good week.